thing. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How's it doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. Could you tell me, like, do you remember your first appearance in Biden's work? How did you came over here? Which mean of transport? Oh, that's you? a long What's time. Yeah, yeah. But that's a long time ago. I can't. I think I came with boat. To be honest, my father had a small 13 feet boat, open boat, like a small speed boat. So we came. I went fishing into the into Grenfell in here, and uh, then we passed by Barnsburg and we went on land. It wasn't always easy at that time, so we had to, like you had to come and you had to be greeted and you you were taken. But later on, when we got to know the concerts a lot better. Life was a lot better in Barnsburg as well. Yeah, but let's but I remember it. You had the farms and you had uh, greenhouses and it, no, this was like a small city before. A lot of people and then in, in, when you came in um, for the weekends, which we often did because my father was working, then everybody was dressed up, walking in the streets, in the bus Sunday clothes, <laughs> giving candies to the kids, which were us, we loved it. So it, it was like coming to a small city city center in a while because in longer we didn't have that so that and do you remember how old you were at the time when you came over here no i don't i can i i would guess i was but if you like sweet, five six uh, years or something so you can say that the time it was like super nice over here with the candies and everything <laughs> well, that's what kid remember yeah, as yeah, candy no i just kid. remember that like it was like it was like it's coming to a city center. In Longyearbyen you had these poor like hubs and you're walking in between and we didn't have like, this, this common house, cultural house or anything. So this was different in a way. So that time it was a bit more boring. Yeah, yeah. it has changed. But yeah. uh, and how you end up over here? What made you end up over here? Where have you been born? Actually, it's a question interesting. I was born on North Cape in Norway, oh, the commu yeah. community of North, North Cape. In Honingsborg actually. That's what and uh, then we moved up here when I was one and a half. My brother was just born, it was like a couple of months. But my father came to Longyearbyen as in charge of the workshops in the, in the coal mines. And then you had mine number three, four, six, seven and five. So he was like in charge of the, the electrical workshops in the mines. In the mines. That's what he was. And then, I think he, actually, he loved that job because he didn't have to be in an office too. So he was a lot in the mines and then was a bit in the office, so he was back and forth. But that was what he, he did. And we settled down in Longenbein. and my mother hated it in the beginning, of course. There was just a man's community and coal mining and dust and mud and everything. But uh, later on, she was okay. She was home with us. Then she... She was a mother. <laughs> she was a mother in the beginning, and then I, when I was in fourth grade. How old are you then? Ten years old? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Then she started being like a, 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 um, a lifesaver up in the swimming pool. So she was like the, the person going around looking for people and taking care of, so yeah, don't do this and don't do that. Don't and do this, like, yeah. So she was doing that. And after that, she studied and became a teacher, and she was teaching at the school in Longham the last, last year of her career. They stayed a lot longer than I actually thought they would. So they still live in Longyearbyen. That's like, we came in 1964 and they're still living in Longyearbyen. 1964 you came? Uh, and 1964. You, and they're still over here living? Yes. So they're just like, I guess, mostly enjoying their life. <sighs> oh no, they're old, come on. <laughs> they're old. But yes, they are enjoying and their life. And the mother, life. did she like, no? Yeah, yeah no, 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 but she, 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 no, everybody, this is the place I want to be, definitely. It is. But it was, um, and also my, we saw the family business. We didn't have any family business actually. My father tried, tried to sell snow scooters, <laughs> Lynx. When we were kids, I, I can imagine it was like in the 70s. He had Lynx and, and, and he sold a couple, but he had to wait for the paychecks and they were paying later. And so the business didn't go that good. So he quit. So like but when you've been a child and came over here on Svalbard, what was your first impression? How do you feel yourself being a child? No, I did, well, that's what, for me, this was the only life. I didn't have anything. I mean, going to Norway was a challenge. And that was different than going to... Well, we were living up here. Um, I think my father had two months vacation every year. So when I was... Was it six or was it five? Five, maybe younger, we went to Spain for the first time. Oh. And you can imagine, you come from this island, 
no bacterias, there was no airport, there was no planes, there were nothing. So there were no bacterias, no tourists, no corona. <laughs> so when we went to Norway, we got sick because the bacterias were different. But can you imagine when we went to Spain? So we had every morning before we like, when we woke up, my father gave us this much of a whiskey, a cognac every morning to, oh. with a, before <laughs> breakfast to like Good clean, to clean, to clean the body. And that helped. So you like Spain? <laughs> yeah, we love cognac, both me and my brother. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So no, that's, uh, this, is, this was life for me. Swabber was life. This is where I grew up. And uh, but once you've told me that uh, uh, good friendship between a father uh, of yours and the uh, general consulate of Soviet Union, if I'm not mistaken. Well, right? not Soviet Union, but like Barisburg, yeah. That's true. Um, my father came and he was part of my mother as well. We came with our parents. Oh, we all came to this, to Barisburg and Pyramid, and they had exchanges, sports exchanges. And uh, that's how I met Barisburg, as I told you. But some years later, or when they had this council coming, they came with helicopter to Longaby and they bought things. They went to the shop. And one day my father was just after the vice consul in the queue. And he just had a couple of kroners too little, <laughs> short. So he said, no, come on, I can, I, I, I'll, I'll lend it to you. Yes, but you have to come and get it back in Barisburg. Yeah, no problem. So when we came next time, we were like, picked up on the harbor, we were taken all the way up to the consul's building, and we had dinners, and the kids had movies, and they were playing table tennis. So it was like these greetings of the consul and the vice consul, beautiful people. So we were like treated with, uh, what I'd say, both me and my brother were really impressed with all the luxury and all the style these guys had. <laughs> Yeah, that was another time, because we grew up on, on, during the Cold War. Huh? Russians, they were the enemy. But for us, I mean, come on, enemies. <laughs> These are the old friends. <laughs> no, it's true. It's, you, you learn to appreciate the, the, the Russian culture, the Russian people. And, and you said nice. that like, you were coming over here like on the sport exchange and the cultural exchange. So you mean that your parents uh, were taking part in the sport exchanges? And, like, yes, and they did. My father played chess and table tennis, and my mother was shooting rifle and playing table tennis. So at that time it was like a shooting rifle competition. Uh, yes, I, yes, I think it was. Yes. Wow. But just to have to tell you that my father, in the age of 84 now, he's still taking part in the chess competition. So uh, he's still doing these exchanges. When the Russians came to Longyearbyen to do their shows. It was just fucking amazing. Yeah. And it was also twice a year before, yeah? Yeah. So no, it was once there and once here. So it was just once. But it was like so, it was just amazing what the Russians actually did. Compared to like, we were like just dancing and doing a little small shows. And then the Russians came to us and there was music and there was uh, costumes, I guess, eh? costumes and dancing and singing, of course. And then they had these, um, oh, what do you call these people? It was like... Jugglers? Jug no, well, all the I circus people are the balancing on chairs, all the way oh. to the roof. And it was just like mind-blowing. Like circus? Or was it, it was almost like a fucking like circus. They, maybe they were coming prepared, you know, like I an think, entertaining group. I think when people, I th actually think that when you had coal miners working here, they chose coal miners which were good, which were good in sports and culture as well. To have that in this place, yes, but also to win all the competitions because you were so much better than us. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, that time, uh, I guess now we that was a competition. Yeah. That was a competition that you had to win, probably, because it was more like, yeah, it's more, more important. More important to win right now. Now it's just like- No, it's more fun. Have fun, yeah. yeah. But that time it was like a bit to show as well. That Absolutely, we do this as absolutely. Well. It was like amazing. Yeah, and the same with the farms and the food you had. It was also like mind-blowing. So the food, and do you remember like oh, the day of the pigs and like... I do. And the cows. We had, yeah. And the cows here and the oxes, they were huge. They were fucking huge. Yeah, this musk, 
or how they call it, the, like the ox, like the big ones. Yeah, 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 the main ones. I mean, yeah. yeah, no. And, uh, and the food we also got, it was all fresh, fresh food, fresh vegetables. We didn't like that too much, the freshness, because... You know, in childhood, you didn't No, we like didn't that. have any. We grew up without having anything fresh for our whole lives. And then we like went to, to Norway to on vacation. And then we could have some fresh food. But then we didn't eat the fresh b- food because we weren't used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We weren't like meat and potatoes and that's it. Vegetables, no way. <laughs> you don't understand them. I was time. 19 years old before I like, had the guts to try to eat a strawberry. That's serious. That's yeah. sick. That's sick. That's weird even. That that's yeah, it is. Years old and you How can you like eat those berries? It's berries. I mean, I haven't eaten a berry before. Oh, the stage. Let's go here. Do you remember maybe? I ne- I never been on the stage. Never been on the stage? No. no. Come on. Never been on the stage. On this maybe stage. Never been on any stage, have I? Yeah, probably, but oh. none of this. But your stage is like an open world. We don't do performance on stages. We do them in streets and... Have you been taking part in any sports competitions or cultural exchange? No. Even cultural exchange? No, we were like, me and my brother, we were swimming. We, did, we, were, yeah, we, we, we only were like, we were living in the pool, swimming. <laughs> so, no. But there were no competitions in swimming? Then. No, there were no competitions in swimming. Ah, okay. And your brother, Stick, uh, is he older brother? No. Elder one? He's the kid brother. He's a, he's a baby boy, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's the baby brother. He's mid 80s. And he bought that small ship and started taking scientists and expeditions out and after that he uh, he needed something to do winter time as well because he, he couldn't have a fixed job because he was working with the boat summertime so then he bought some some shitty old scooters and started fixing them outside in the snow and um, and finally after some years he had a workshop and everything worked and scooters and band then band wagons and then today like so it has expanded. First with farm, the boat, snow scooters, then he bought Langesen, Philip Joran. Yeah, he's doing good. He's a businessman. Yeah, I, I don't know if he's a businessman, but he's the one making money. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's still doing a lot because like, I think that the tourism uh, is not just facing the problems we are right now, uh, facing all over the world the same one. Uh, but like from year to year, the tourism is growing. It has been growing. From the point he started the business, and what we have now, I guess it's more and more people coming. It has been growing every year. But I don't know what will happen after these 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 uh, corona times. Hard to say. People talking about changes. People start traveling. The world will change. We will pollute less. Tourism is bleeding, and. But the government has to save businesses. So this island is again not giving anything back to the, uh, to, 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 to the government. It's taking even more to save the business. Tourism is really wonderful. It's like the first thing shutting down. And now after the corona, we will have three years of economic crisis. People aren't going to travel anymore. They, don't have, they can't afford it. They have to like Businesses are going bankrupt and the world is changing. And I'm not going to be a pessimist, but it hasn't. When will the next corona come? I don't believe in tourism as the industry as well, but I do not believe in it. I don't believe in making money out of tourism and science on these islands. I don't believe in that. If you're going to have people appear, just like have people appear. But I think tourism and science costs more money than running like the, mine, the coal mining we did. I do think that it's possible to run do other kind of tourism. Maybe, but that's not, that's a capitalistic view. Taking more, less people who pays more. the days when you were coming with the Hennessy transport and just all the people that were coming out from their boat over here they were much more happy persons you know like, can you, can and you were just like all the time can you explain what did you what's what did wrong you with the, the people what's time? wrong with the guides today <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the question what's wrong because that time I remember before the ship would just 
only just coming to the harbor and everybody they were just waving their hands they were happy making pictures they were already in the russian society before they came on the land they were in so the russian mood before they came yeah yeah <laughs> so you know us a lot <laughs> no i don't i think it's um yeah i worked a lot for my brother doing tours because i'm an artist and i didn't want to have a fixed job so i needed like date like part-time jobs and working for my brother was a nice way to do that and I liked also working with people at the time. You get really uh, doing it for 10 years, you get tired, but it was... Can I ask a question, when you came to Pyramid, did you move the ship on your own, so you were jumping from the ship and moving, because there were no persons inside Pyramid, or there were some? Oh, I mean, did that for, I did that on all the way up till... 2000 and... I guess. Yeah, something like that. Jumping so you the ships. Jumping out, mooring the yeah, ship. Yeah, yeah. So you were the boss over there, like. The no, I was just, I was just a guide. Yeah, yeah. I was right. kicking for the people. <laughs> I was doing the zodiac. I was mooring the boat. I was, yeah, I was. But it was fun. And also, when you, when you travel with these tourists, and they pay a fortune to come up here, it's expensive to go. It's expensive to live. You have to give them everything. I think that was what I did. I gave them everything until I didn't feel for doing it anymore, and then I quit. So I, I didn't do the job for only the money. It was also because I loved being with the people, telling them the stories. So I think that's my, that might be the difference. I don't know. Well, I left when I was 19, and then I came back in 2009. And then I can remember things. Then, then I stayed because this was a different life. I was working as a photographer in Oslo. And... Uh, and coming here up here and working for my brother for a season because I needed money didn't go that good that year and then I remember this was like so peaceful suddenly you got time instead of running around trying find finding parking space and queuing up and doing all this like shit you do in a big city yeah. and then with all that time I was like god this I had to I had to move back and now all the time is gone again I don't think I would have been living in Longyearbyen or lived up here at all if it was the goal, old community. Can you imagine, Ivan, to be stuck up here for six, seven months a year without any possibility yeah. to escape? Without, like, if you want to go today in Longyearbyen, if you, like, sit on a Wednesday and go, oh, God, I want to have Thursday lunch in Rome. And you can do that. You don't do it, but you can. you can. It's all about what you can, not what you do. And I think that's that is important. If you want, so I was. It was a good place when I was a kid growing up, and life was just there. Now, when you're older and and you're looking at the possibilities you have in life, yeah, I mean, you always look at the possibilities. And if someone t tries to sh cut down the possibilities, you like protest and I would. And being stuck up here without any possibility to escape, I think that would be... Just to have fun somewhere. I would have done it for one or two years, but I wouldn't have done it for ten. I need the, um, the uh, freedom to choose my life every day. And you can up here. Even though you are living up on the island as far north as you can come, where you have any civilization living. So we are living in the extreme land, almost on the North Pole, with all we need. We're having vodka, we're having friends, we're having visitors, we're living on tourism, and we can meet interesting people every day in the bars, in the hotels, Everywhere. when we are working and we can leave when we want. I mean, seriously, where do you find this win, 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 win situation? And look at the nature we have. It catches the eye always. You get never tired of that. I've been living here for, I want, I'm not gonna tell <laughs> but I've been living a long time. And every time I go out, and every time I am, today when I was putting, jumping on my snow scooter coming here, I was sitting there smiling. Every time I go on the snow it goes 10 minutes and then I'm smiling. Because, because the freedom up here is great. I know people, I know the business, I have knowledge, people 
will buy that from time to time. Develop my own business as well, the gallery. I have art, we do art projects. So it's hard to leave because you would have to start all over and I don't know, you, you're locked down if you leave. So it's, you, you, you're actually trapped without being trapped. You're trapped in your liberty. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But you are. In total, nineteen. <laughs> oh, too much. That's too a good. Much, yeah. Too much. I want to leave. I want to leave. But I probably won't. Building a gallery, and so I probably have to stay a bit more. I think. Yeah, because I know that you are having lots of plans. I do you have a lot of plans for your future? I can't get like old and poor. I have to have a bit of money when I get old. So it's time to start working now to get some money. Not only making art and having fun. Yeah, and. Uh, but this is going to be fun as well. And what uh, was your life uh, before you start your art projects, uh, traveling all over the world with the projects? Because I know that you've been visited in many countries. But uh, before we start this, what made you just like go into it? Into performance. Into performance. Maybe you were from the childhood talking lots of fairy tales to your parents or just singing chants. <sighs> Uh, on the New Year's parties, you know, like when you were a boy, what made you go? I don't know, it's... Well, I worked for 10 years in the business in Norway and a bit in France and studying and all these things. But sitting in an office was boring. So I, I stopped. I, uh, I quit and I borrowed the camera and I started as a, as, a, as a photographer. I did that for 10 years in Oslo. So that was the start of going to like working for yourself and once I decided well when they had the war in Iraq when the Americans had attacked Iraq I said I want to make this this project of putting like these white crosses marble crosses you find in Normandy I want to place them in all cities or in, in cities in all countries participating in the war in, uh, in Iraq and I started doing that, and the first thing I did when I had the, the, made the small cemetery of, I think it was 25 crosses, I put it up in front of the parliament in Norway first, and then I was standing there looking at these crosses, it was beautiful. And then I felt, this needs some more, a performance. I didn't know it was a performance. So I started doing a thing with the, with the, with the, with the main cross, it's like the original laying in this wooden box. So it was this wooden box and the cross laying in, it looked like a a cross laying in a coffin. So I took off this cross and I was laying down on the on the ground in between the other crosses and I had it on top of me. And I was just laying there. And then suddenly all the kids in the area, because there was a lot of people that day, they came running and laid themselves by the crosses. And that was just so powerful and strong and I thought I traveled the whole summer with the crosses all over Europe and did performances. And that was strong. That was real. That was the nicest summer I've had. And I spent like 20,000 20, euros on like a project, just paying myself and having and I'm really enjoying it. So I'm, I miss that actually, like to, to to have a bigger project and I like continue them and do them instead of going only to festivals and to places and perform and do it like shortly to put like one of the projects into my life and, and follow them and go through like I did with the first one. So I have to come back there some, some, somehow. Um, I've been traveling for 10 years doing performance art, meeting a lot of brilliant artists in the world. And uh, these people, they start asking me when they know I'm from Svalbard, they start asking me, oh, that's, that's exciting. Can we, can we come? Is it possible to come and visit? Can we? And I've been thinking on that for a while and then I thought I should, or well, they also suggested I should make a festival on Svalbard, a performance festival. So it took me like five, six years before I finally got that to happen. So in 2000, and I don't know, five years ago, 
I started Arctic Action at Performance Festival. And the idea was to invite artists I'd met, good artists that I, uh, I admired, and invite them to Svalbard and come here and work with me up in the Arctic. Uh, I thought of there had been like different ways of doing it. The first year I had like one on one artists coming and we had like we were close for like uh, two, well, close to up to two weeks where we like worked together and, and made art, performance art in Longyearbyen and also in Barnesburg and in Pyramiden actually. And that became a tradition to go to Pyramiden with the artists because they they just uh, they just love the place for uh, the visual aspects and the history and it's 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 a strong place to be as, be as a performance artist and i think all artists you have a lot of photographers as well going to pyramiden so after um after uh, doing it for the first year the response was huge so i had to like continue i wanted to continue and we did it for five years it stopped last year or the year before a lot a bit last year as well and uh, and that's due lack to, to funding and uh, it's, it's hard getting the, the money to invite the artist and do what you want to do and then i had all, i had another big project coming as well i was uh, i'm in the i'm in the process of building or putting up a huge gallery of 300 square meters nine meter high building and have an exhibition space and also have a a, a small bistro and a, and, and a bar and, and make this like a social meeting place for art and, and nature and science and everything. So the idea is to, um, well, when I do art, I look at my own things. And I've also been told and I've understood that it is important to work with materials you know, and it's, it's important to know where you're coming from. So I work a lot with ice. When I do my projects up here, I work with, with nature, I do my things in nature. So the idea was to have artists up here who could step out of their like frame and normal frame and, and come into another context and start making performance in the nature, in this huh? magnificent, powerful nature up here, for the nature, about the huh? nature. And all this was to be like filmed Fish and put on social media huh? so that the rest of the world would be able to see it. So that's the idea. And I hope and I think that if we are with good visual pieces showing performance art from, from the Arctic, people will understand the beauty and the power of the Arctic. And I think that also, as a, sm as a small contribution, would, would help uh, us to, uh, to uh, protect the Arctic. That's what I hope and that's what I think. And I think that is, that's my goal with the, with the, the gallery I'm going to put up as well to have more focus on the uh, on the Arctic itself not only artists coming here and, and, and spending a two days or a week and turning around and taking photos in 360 degrees and going back to to Berlin or New York and have a show and oh this is beautiful because they haven't actually been there they have just been up and visiting days. yeah so I want people to stay for, for, for months and, and be out with me and other guides and like live and freeze and, and, and have a shitty time and have a good time, both. Then they can make art, then they can understand what they see. Really grateful to be included in, in that uh, in that group of people or in that environment and being able to travel and be creative. And I think also making art, making performance is like playing. It's, it's, it is serious, but it is also not that serious. 
because you can't take yourself that serious because you, you when you do performance just once yeah you, you will you can't I mean you will you will do failures and the failures in the performance is actually what makes the performance trying and seeing how how it works and it's just like a bit like when you was a kid growing up here in Longebin where you had all of the storage outside for yourself and we were playing in between and amongst and we did all these crazy things and had fun and built things and so doing performance is a, like I do a bit physically it's a bit of the same thing and it's 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 uh, liberating it's good I need it yeah yeah I need it I guess we should go over there okay. to the telephone you're gonna call the restaurant. Are oh, you gonna call the restaurant? No, you're gonna call the no, restaurant. Gonna call no, you're gonna call the restaurant. No, you're gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna call the restaurant. <laughs> well, I'm gonna call because restaurant. you're gonna order the dinner. What on this dinner? Uh, when is dinner? When you would like to have dinner? No, I don't know. When is when? We, no, we need to have some vodka before we have dinner. Yeah. You can't like That's come on. Yeah. Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> It's raining. Of course it's raining. Hi. Hello, this is Stein. Can I order a nice dinner for three to this evening? Thank you. Bye. You should order vodka as well. It's no matter of order, you know. It's a matter of entering the bar. So as soon as we're gonna enter, I guess the vodka will be already, you know, like icy. Like icy. I know that lots of time you've been walking up and down the stairs in Barensburg. I have, and when I was a kid, this was like climbing a mountain. I mean, I prefer actually the stairs, the old stairs they had, because they were like more colorful, and they were like not not this massive. They were like nicer, slimmer. So they were Everything was nicer in the good old days. In the Google. Ah. Well, it was made nicer things. This is solid. This is efficient, but not as nice. Not that nice. No. So the older ones are better. But I remember you had you had this um, this guide here. He was a small, light guide, and he was he was coming up and down these stairs all the time because he was alone that these summers. How and long it was ago? Oh, that was in that's nine nine years ago. Oh, nine years ago, yeah. And we had a that time I was fit. That time. What about so you were like running all the way up the stairs to see if it could be the first man, the first man up the stairs. He won. But he did win. So he did. I wouldn't try to run it now. He was, was good. Yeah, too many people were coming over here. Too many people are living. And people are moving and people are coming. They're staying for two. Today they're staying for six for a season, six months, or maybe two seasons, or maybe three, and then they leave. Some years ago, what was the average? Three years? Three living? years of stay. It yeah, was, but it's less now. Yeah, because we have like tourism growing much and much. Yeah, and, more. and so like the, the season walkers. And and the, well, in the beginning, it was like more the, the serious actors. Well, they're still serious. And also the guides were like the guides living there and having a new opportunity and, 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 and being guides. But no. You see that these guys living for years, having a family and everything, because you it's hard to live on a tourist or a guide or in tourism wages because the, the the cost of living is so high. So having a family and everything is hard on a tourism salary. So basically, you have these young guys or girls coming up for adventure, staying for a while and then they leave. I would say like the guides coming here are long time tourists. Yeah. With a salary. Yeah, yeah, with a salary, yeah. yeah. But it's like kind of a so cyber soldiers. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a bit sad. You see people, you like them and they leave. And then you do this again and again and again, so... Too many new people coming, but what about... The you stayed a long time, haven't you? Fifth year. Yeah, no, I'm more than three years, so I can yeah. say that I'm staying a lot. Yeah. If we compare to the average. But the, the 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 advantage of this thing, if you if that if you really fuck up, <laughs> it's all forgotten after after three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can start all over again. All over again, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> like you can just make it like three years term and then like just yeah. okay yeah. i'll come back again and uh, but we have the people that are staying over here for a long a long period of time i know you had people staying here for like 30 years uh, we have several in Bidensburg, but in Longibun, for example. Do you know such one people? That My parents have been staying since 1964. Uh, Nuta Mahas, Jakobsen, the guy in charge of LNS, or the, these brothers. Yeah, there's some coal miners, there's some people, girls marrying coal miners. I would say in Longibun, 30, 40 people, like. He's been here for more than 30 years, I guess. And the ones that are, let's say, but the I, character of, of the land. And not all of them. Some of them are pretty boring, actually. <laughs> we will not talk about the names, yeah? <laughs> no, not, not mentioning names. Some of them are really interesting and some of them are really boring. But that, I think that's how it is. Enough. I like the thing of that it's new people coming all the time. You have a... Well, if you go out in Longyearbyen and up here as well, it's the same thing. If you meet in the bar one evening, you could be sitting talking to uh, politicians, artists, uh, tramps, uh, adventure people, whatever. You will, you will all find. You will find them all. That is interesting. That is interesting. Let's say like ten years ago, when the people were coming over here to work and to live, that left. And now, do you feel the difference between the people's mentality or something that have changed for them? Maybe they have another goals than ten years ago. I think when people came, like only ten years ago, they were more interested in the island, more interested in staying and finding a spot, finding their place, and maybe also giving back to the island. Today I feel people come just for a brief meeting to, to have an adventure and, uh, and, uh, and then they leave. And more taking something and not giving back. Uh, so 10 years ago they were like more, the population was more stable. I knew the people. Today I don't know the people. I was queuing up for a midsummer last year and I looked at the people in the queue. I didn't know anybody. <laughs> no, it is changing. Times, they are changing. And the ones from your childhood, I guess it was totally different. Then it was totally different. Then we had the last boat leaving in October, November. And the first boat coming in May, June. And in between, Nothing. isolated. We had, so the coal miners, they were coal mining winter time. So everybody had winter contracts. They didn't have summer contracts because winter, summer, the mines, everything was main, maintained. And then they had the special groups to maintain the equipment and maintain everything. And then new contracts and the coal miners came up and they had enough, uh, another winter. And the director of the company was called Winter Director because he was only like being director of winter time. So that was how it was. And the company owned everything, the road, the housing, the cantinas, the food stocks, I mean the schools, the hospital, everything was owned by the company and run by the company. So you can imagine all the costs it was to running such a community. We ordered the food and there was, the food was delivered every month from a truck to our stairways, to our door. We had to go with buckets to pick up milk, put the bucket in in the evening, or in the daytime and got the milk in the evening. And the people coming, they stayed for years. So they came back and came back and came back because they liked it, they had friends, they made money. Even though they had families and houses and whatever down on, on the mainland in Norway. They liked this life. And uh, you can also imagine like how was the, 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 the communication to Norway? You could pick up the phone and call long distance, but then the woman or the man sitting doing the switching picked up everything, so you couldn't like be private. So the most of the communication went between mail, letters. We had the planes coming over, driving over the airport in the valley and dropped the post and they left. So then we were running around trying to find everything and picked up all the posts. I think we found everything. We don't know anything, yeah. We think we found everything. Because you don't know what you haven't lost. We didn't know what we lost, we couldn't. We didn't. <laughs> but we lost, we lost. And then 
taking the pot inside and open it up. Then we got all the flus, the bacteria and the flus. Yeah, the disease <laughs> transporter. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it was like different times. Everybody was sick, and then the next everyone, and then everybody like was okay, and then the next plane but, came. Yeah, and then everybody again. got sick. Got sick so again. You, you so you could read the letters, you could have the letters, but you could never send the letter. So there was a, more, more, a lot, one, one way communication. One, one way communication. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like in most marriages, <laughs> and, the, and the workers living here, they were living here for years. They were living up in the barracks, two on, in the room or one in each room. They could have families in Norway, but they were like living up here, being with friends. They were, oh, the pay was good. They loved the job in the mines, and they stayed. So they went back on holidays, and they spent some money with their families, and they came up and started working again. I actually know people being on the boat back to Norway, playing poker, <laughs> gambling. So when they came to Tromsø, all the money was gone. <laughs> so they had to take the boat back again. <laughs> you had to work again. And all this worked fine. But coal mining slowed down. The mines started to be closed in the 80s. And the question was running up, putting up new mines, developing new mines or not. And we had Svea being a big, uh, big uh, project, and the government didn't want to put money into Svea at that point. We had a new director coming, Hermansen, who was put in jail for corruption know, and all know, these things. But he, but he was it. the guy who made Longyearbyen survive. I know the story, yeah. And he was just a smart, clever. Norwegian rules, you can do nothing about it. No, but he was playing by the rules, but he was playing a bit faster. So the rules develop. So he future. he went, yeah, you can say so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He went down to Norway. He went so, down to Norway to the politicians and he said, "Can I, can I build out Svea? Yeah, I think that's a good idea." But and he never listened to the but. So he went and started to develop Svea. And he was like, "Can I have some money for you guys?" Well, yes, but and didn't listen to the but. So he got some money and he started. And then he spent way too much money. He got the deal. If I can manage to develop Svea and make it run and making money without like having money from the government, will it be fine? Yes, was the answer. So he was running out of money. So he sold part of the buildings and the property in Longyearbyen, all owned by the company, to private actors. That's how you split up this company town. Yeah. So that's how it started, and then he got more money by selling the government property to private. To private then he got some money, and then he could finish the development of Svea. And he, he succeeded, and it took out so much coal in so short time. So they made like the, the the benefits was huge, and the coal prices went wrong, and and everything was yeah. shut down, and he was put in prison for corruption, and a new director, and you know the story. And that was the first steps of trying to just jump from the monopoly company. Longyearbyen was at Barensburg. Yeah, yes, before, before. Yeah. And it's changed to something else. Well, the coal mining was closed down, and then the question was, what is Longyearbyen going to live on now? And the, uh, the obvious answer from the government was science, university, yeah, so on, which was established. And then tourism, which also was building up and establishing. Uh, tourism started early 90s, then there was like barely a little bit going on, not much. And then it developed like faster and faster going up. So they decided tourism and science. And uh, I don't know how smart that is. You don't, tourism, science is costing money. That doesn't generate any money. Yeah, but they give us a new information or something. True, if it, if but I, it, it's, it, we're talking about like what is going to run the community. Science doesn't give anything back to community. Yeah, yeah. And the scientists are sitting in the university and the students can't afford to go out. So they're sitting in the, in, in, in the, like, in the dorm. The Shutting down the coal mines in Longyearbyen also made the Norwegians disappear. This stable community of well-paid Norwegians with families, taking part of the culture life, buying in shops, spending their money locally, and to a different 
society where people come and they they're on adventure they save some money they don't earn much money what they have they they, they, they come and they spend a little they earn and they take if they have more they take it back home and they have an adventure and people come and they go and they come and go it's like fast it's this fast turning you have friends <laughs> yes I do sometimes it's like a director if the director call and stay I'm very sorry ah. hello I'm just going to say hello to Timothy. Hi! Oh, Corona times! Yeah! I want to say you thank you. A oh, pleasure! For your visit. Pleasure. Your answer for our idea. Yeah, no, as I said to the to Ivan. Stain, you remember about the game I told you? Oh God, is this a game? Yeah, it's always a game with the Russians, you know. Russian roulette. Russian roulette with the shots. So, uh, I know that you are a big fan of vodka. I am. I, I, yeah. Everybody knew it. Yeah, so let's start. Black like, uh, yeah. Cut or roll or film or whatever. Last question. <laughs> oh, you know that. Too. So that was how it was. Only coal mining, no flights, no communication, no post. And then it has changed to what it is a multi global community with all kinds of entertainment bars, hotels, the concerts, one after each other. There's like I mean, you won't find any place in the world with only 2,000 people where you have all these possibilities and all the offers you have. It's extraordinary. It's just like insane. Before the planes and after the planes, that's what's defining Longyearbyen. And that's what's supposed, I think that's the, what's defining Weisberg as well. Except you had the... Uh, you, you have all your politics and uh, yeah, everything yeah, changing. Yeah, yeah. And it is interesting to see, when I left Barnsburg, we're like more developed than Longyearbyen in many ways. And when I came back, it was the opposite in many ways. And could you tell me and share your own opinion about Barnsburg? And what is good, what is bad? What shall we change, what shall we keep? When we came to this place during the uh, coal mining period, the Cold War, it was Soviet Union, it was like coal mining, it was communism. And I left in 79. Still, Soviet Union being strong. Barnesburg, Pyramid being strong. I've been there like back and forth just visiting now and then without paying too much attention but when I came back then Glasnost had been and uh, and you could see that in Barnesburg the pyramid was closed down Barnesburg was run down because they had I guess that Soviet Union had more than enough just looking after their borders instead of looking up to the north yeah, because yeah, we can do we can do that later on and they forgot about these people, so they were starving, and they had, they had a really hard time people living in, in Barnsburg. And I would say, yeah, after 2009, 2005, 2009, then when I felt things were starting to move on. There was no tourism in Barnsburg five years ago. Not much. Not much, yeah, it was like something. I think you jumped into tourism pretty fast and sudden, and it did it very well. 
uh, you have had a minor, a couple of minor setbacks, but you are doing good. And also, I see this settlement Bartberg is growing. I see that people in Lehman and Bartberg they have money. They are happy. They don't need anything from anybody else. They are they're getting everything from the state because before you felt the need of giving. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. And today, there's not there's none of that. They are getting everything they need from the company and from the society they live in, which is a great thing. Which means it's nice to come, it's nice to hang out, and then we are equal. Could you imagine, like in the eighties, talking to many people in English, like you? Do no, like no, 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 no. Like, 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 like seriously, open mind. If I'm you go, if open you mind. go, like six years back. Six years so back. Only six years, for example. Eight years back. Eight years back. There was only two people speaking English: the guide and the doctor. That, that's the shitty thing. Yeah, but seriously. Yeah, but now you can just talk to lots of people. Yeah, and, you know, anybody. You can understand each other. Yeah. And it's no, no matter of uh, which nationality you have, you understand each other. Yeah. And, and you know what you feel. And in pyramid, it was like talking about the pyramid. Two years back. Three years back. No one speaking. Yeah. English. You had to like, you had to like, oh God, we were like kissing and hugging and like telling like... Yeah, just with the feelings and the emotions, you were just sharing the thoughts and the yeah. ideas with the emotions. But could you tell me about the cheers, my friend? With the pyramid and because uh, being abandoned, being closed, uh, the people being uh, not only laid off but released and the settlement being just conservated. And then we have the period when the Norwegian travelers came by their own without any Russian people staying in Pyramiden, doing the tourism. How do you feel Pyramiden as the main... Uh, I did tourism there when there was no Russians there. You did? I did. I was a guide. Yes, you know... I, I would even be like teaching the guides to guide, the Russian guides to guide in Pyramiden. Why? Sasha was under my training. Yeah, so he was your trainer. Or you no, no, I trained him. You trained him. It is like pretty strange to look like 10 years we've, we've done like in development of tourism up here. For me, it's, it feels like it's 50 years back because it was so different. You were like going into the harbor, nails coming out everywhere and like how do you do these things? Jumping on land, mooring the ship, walking through the settlements, no one in the cafes, no guides. Buildings were like not open, I think, but they started to get closed. Yeah, yeah. No, I think the culture house was open. There was a couple of buildings open. And you did all this, and then wandering, walking through this ghost town, as we called it. It's not a ghost town anymore. Any, anymore, of course. Yeah. No, it's like a... That was, I'm trying to get it from you, you know? No, it's, no, it's, no, it's starting to grow as, as a tourist place. Do I like it? Yeah. Do you like it? As a development settlement now? No? I think I would have done things differently. All of them or some? Some. some. So in some ways we're working in the same direction you are thinking as well. I think the hotel is beautifully done and it's done like I want it. Because I need a good bed to sleep in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of other things I think you should leave untouched. Some buildings? Shouldn't be renovated. Should have the old style. I think, I think there's a danger that you're going too far in Pyramid. Uh, that it make any sense for the Russian settlements to develop as much as Barentsburg developed and the Pyramiden nowadays? No. no. But what I think you should do in Pyramiden. What? I should be really careful now. No, it's not about it. This would make your business rock. And I would love it, personally. You should make an Ibiza in Pyramiden. Ibiza? You should restore the hotels have rooms, have Russian bars, have all this Russian style, play music and party night and day because it is you, night you and know, day. Well, you know like a Russian Las Vegas in Long in Pyramid. In pyramid. Oh, but then the pyramid will lost totally the whole history of how it was the But it would have a new one. Yeah that's gonna be a business point, you know like it would have an 
I know people will disagree. But if it was mine. You've been looking at all my performances. They are about getting out of the box in a way, breaking, 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 yeah. breaking my my boundaries and getting free, trying to get as free as possible. And but uh, I like the freedom from being a performance artist because you're out there, you're looking at the space and you have an idea, and then you're putting all this together. And how can you do it? How can you make it happen? And then you never do things things twice. So, so you plan and you try to look at all the eventualities and what's going to happen. And then you do it. And in the middle of the performance, you go, "Oh, this won't work." <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to improvise. And I think that is the beauty of making performances. But having this 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 open game and yeah, yeah, yeah. not everything in in, in control then you're so excited, like so tense yourself. And I like that. Is this going to work? Is this going to work? It, I, I, I think it's totally beautiful, liberating, and, and just my time there. It's my time, and I'm alone with that. And the energy from the audience. You feel the energy when you start. Maybe when you do it, but you don't see the audience. Yeah, you yeah. just like, you're in your work. It's and, I, and I like that, because that put me in a... In a position, I can't. I can't run away. I can't give up. I have to like go through it all the way. And that's a challenge. That can be a challenge yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I was laying once on cobblestone in front of a museum in, in, in Helsinki, the Kiasma, with a block of 130 kilos of ice on my back. I was going to lay there for three hours, and after one and a half. I felt such pain in my in my rib. There was something in my rib. And I had in case, I don't know why I did that, but I just put a, like a small knife in my pocket, in my suit. And then I thought, I have to get loose from this. But And then I looked around and I could see the same shoes as I saw when I started the performance. This guy had been standing one and a half hour looking at me. How could I then take my knife up? I cut myself loose. I couldn't do that. I had to like, yeah, you are being watched. You have to focus on what you're doing. So I had to like liberate myself from the, the ice without using a knife. Another one and a half hour. And the guy, did he stand up to the oh, He was, he was standing at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't like just cut yourself free. You have to respect the audience as well. I'm impressed by some of these people like watching, sitting there watching for hours. For hours. Art can be dangerous. Art is dangerous. dangerous. But I think art is a lot less dangerous now than it was before. When you couldn't say anything. I think that's one of the reasons for performance art being that. It was, pop it was popular in China. It was popular in Russia as well. Because it's like it's, 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 um, it's a way of getting out and telling a story and protesting and getting out your message and, and they can just leave. It's in fast on and it's it's powerful. And could you tell me, like, uh, uh, being working a lot uh, with the gallery right now, I guess, uh, yes. much of your time, could you tell me, like, the plans, or maybe how long will it take you and you find the final plan of the idea to make it, or you're still just on the crossroads? Like? No, no, I'm 
I'm um, applying for things and, and I bought the building in Svea, so we're going to recycle the building in Svea. So the old the welding workshop in Svea is going to be moved to Longebyen. So if everything goes as planned, it will be shipped in July, August from Svea, coming to Longebyen a couple of days after with the ship, with Bring. And then it will be put up. So I, I would guess the gallery, the building to be standing in November. And then, depending on financings, we'll see how it works. But if I'm, it will be running in, 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 in January, I think. That's like eight, nine months. Eight, nine months. It's good, huh? Yeah, it's quite possible. We need to put it up, that's one thing. And we need to get more money. And then we need to start planning the, 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 the first exhibition. Because when it opens, we have to have an ex exhibition ready. So there's a lot of things going on. And can you tell me, when you came to this idea of making the gallery, buying the house, and it's just, I guess it was not like, in a second, just came to your mind, and you decided to, why not to make it? I guess you've just been thinking about it. I started doing the pro thinking about it in 2016 and applying for land. And then I took part of the areal plan that I called the, the local community planning. And also with Stora Norske. But then when anything, everything was ready and, okay, now the land is ready, then I had to apply. So there were like 20 companies applying or people apply, applying. And I got it. So I was lucky. They believed in the idea of creating one of the most important galleries in the world up here. Then. And I actually thought I could do that. Yeah, then you have the so I have, uh, I have a lot of, it's a, it's a lot of pressure. But I think uh, finding some of the most important or most interesting artists in the world today, invite them here, take them out, spend time with them, and help them out, help them make what they want to do. Then they have to exhibit here. I think we then will have one of the most interesting galleries in the world up yeah. here. So maybe people, when people come up here, they come up and they do these couple of days watching art and the galleries and then they do a couple of days in the wild yeah. not everything in the wild yeah, yeah. that's we a good thing right so now. how do you think what is the future of all the settlements of all the Svalbard what you can wish to this land from your own opinion uh, what you can say what is the best way for all of us who are sharing the same land to do for future Yes. Very hard. <laughs> yeah, that was a complex question. That was all in one question. Yes, all in all, all the questions we had before, like all in all, all of us. I think I would have to start with saying that all these places you mentioned, from the Russian societies to the Norwegians, to also, you probably forgot about the Polish small. All these places have souls, charismas. They've changed these charismas, these souls, these characteristics. Not everything to become the same or alike, because then it loses interest. That's why I would like to come to Barnesburg and Pyramiden and feel that I'm in Russia. I would like to be in Longyearbyen and feel that I'm in Norway. And this is starting to disappear. In a way. I think we're all trying to be like hypermodern and, and yeah. Follow the globalization. Yeah. But Pyramid today is also unique because they fixed up the hotel but they kept the wooden tiles made in the workshop down by the harbour from timber imported yeah, by yeah, boat. Yeah, yeah. So all the I mean you can see the timber comes, they make it in the workshop, the they put on the wall, the stuff. floors, the roof, everything. <laughs> you should keep those things because in Long Island, maybe that we don't have any of, of, of the old uh, history. But the Russian settlements. This is history, and you should you should like take care of it. No. It's a hard land to develop. This is just like 
as far away you can get from the world yeah. still being connected I think this will be the brilliant place to have like off connection stays not tourism like having retreats where people can come and stay with no activities no connections no plans just detoxing and getting out of getting away from the world yeah. and just be instead of explore i think that is the future of this place so nobody's going to agree with me so i'm actually really glad personally that is you don't have any tourists this year it's so yeah. calm When you go traveling, you, you see that yourself. There's not a lot of people knowing what Arctic is. What's happening up here, what Svalbard is, where is Svalbard? I don't even know that. Mm -hmm. if, you want, if you want people to change, change the world, if you want like the environment to change, then you have to show people what the world is. If you in front of the screens, so in front of internet, in front of having all that information, they know that the world is changing. And they also know that with the coronavirus today, the world has gotten a lot cleaner. So where are we going from now, after the virus has gone? Are we going back to normal, or what, and what will be normal? Yeah, yeah, what, so what are, we gonna, be normal, are we going to change the world? Are we going to be a cleaner and nicer place? Are we going to take care of the planet? Or are we just going to do our bus business as usual? Yeah, as usual and just twice more. No, that's not going to happen. That's, we that's can't, we can't do that. Thing. No, we can't do that. We have to, do, we have to make a change. I think, society, because all the quarantines, all the measurements we are taking is to protect the weak people in the society. So we're crashing the econ economy in all these countries just to protect the weak. So we are like sacrificing ourselves to take care of the oldest people in, in the community. So that shows that we can sacrifice parts of our lives to take care of the nature as well, yeah. to take care of the planet. I think that is a beautiful thing coming out of this. Corona 